Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I have Talia Welsh. Talia is a professor of philosophy, gender studies, and sexuality at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. She was absolutely fantastic during this interview. I, I felt really honored to finally get somebody on here that really has done a lot of good work with Merleau Ponty, someone that I have a particular affinity with. And so in this episode, we talked about her background in philosophy, how she kind of got into philosophy, and then with Merleau Ponty specifically, along with her work in gender and feminine studies. We talk about the philosophy of Merleau Ponty and how one understands the experience of their own being through the body. We talk about an uh, overview of phenomenology and then Merleau Ponty's contribution to the field of, of uh, phenomenology. We, she has a really nice way of explaining how Merleau Ponty's philosophy can be and is applied in modern day and how we see it in many things in life. And so she gives a few examples of how that works out. We then talk about Merleau Ponty's philosophy and then the juxtaposition that it has with psychology and how he viewed child psychology and how he taught on child psychology. And then we talk about her uh, work on gender, feminism, sexuality briefly towards the end, and some of the differences. Uh, Talia was a, a really just a lovely person to engage with, um, and she's someone that I would love to talk to again in the future about many of the other things we didn't get a chance to talk about. So now I bring you Talia Welsh. I am here with Talia Welsh. Talia, how's it going? Good. Good. Thank you. Um, I, uh, as well as you can do in COVID time. So I, I know. Yeah. It's, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a strange, strange 12 months, 13 months yeah. for some people. It's, it's been a strange time. So both on the teaching end and, uh, just work in general. So yeah. I appreciate you coming on. I will let listeners know that, um, most of them probably know anyways, I'm a big fan of philosophy and I was checking out this, uh, book. Um, which is the lectures by Merleau Ponty, who we're going to talk about today. And I looked at the book and I was reading it. It was fantastic. And then I saw that it was translated by yourself. And so yeah. I reached out and said, hey, do you want to come and talk a little Merleau Ponty? So that's kind of the, the backstory here, which I greatly appreciate you taking your time to, to do that. So why don't you just give us your potted biography. Just kind of tell us um, who you are, what your expertise is, what your, um, you know, any degrees or okay. any current research is okay. in. And yeah, just a little bit of background in, in kind of the, I guess, the academic side of, of where you're at. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm, I guess I should say I'm from Canada. I live uh, now, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So pretty far away from where I come from. Uh, and I got into philosophy as an undergrad at a university called the University of Puget Sound. It's in Tacoma, Washington. And I took a course with a Nietzsche scholar. Cool. And absolutely fell in love with Nietzsche and uh, went on to um, graduate school at Stony Brook um, in New York and sort of interested in continental Nietzsche, Derrida were kind of my initial sort of touchstones. Um, so continental philosophy is... Uh, well, there's a lot of ways to define it, but philosophy that comes out of uh, the post-Hegelian tradition in Europe. So there's a lot of figures that are French and German mm -hmm. speaking. They tend to be the dominant sort of canonical figures. And then, of course, there's contemporary phenomenologists all over the world. And I should say continental philosophers all over the world. So I took um, uh, some courses and I took a course on Merleau-Ponty on art. And he's quite famous, I'd say, for um, his work on aesthetics, um, maybe secondary to his work on embodiment. Mm. And I, I started to see that that might be a project that was worth pursuing. And since I had been living in France, um, a professor asked me if I wanted to translate these lectures of Merleau-Ponty's in child psychology and pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And uh, that was um, a very long, drawn out, uh, difficult process. I don't I, think I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it was it was a challenge, but it, I, I finished it and 
then really got into, through that translation, it really um, piqued my interest in thinking about psychology, um, childhood, um, as something that's philosophically interesting, not just interesting, say, for a, a psychologist or for somebody who's studying human development. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my first um, <clears throat> book was uh, The Childish Natural Phenomenologist was sort of thinking about his work in in phenomenology in general, so not just in those lectures, but in particular in those lectures, because not very many people have written about them. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of want to contribute to the field that way. But also, I also just found it really interesting to think about the relevance of development. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's, I guess, my brief biography. And oh, now I'm, a, I'm a, a UC Foundation professor of philosophy in women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. So that's my current position. Yeah, I was a little curious about the, I don't want to say the jump, but uh, yeah. now you're there. And so you're, you, you're from, you came from uh, you know, France doing the, the, the translation. And then how did you end up in, in Tennessee? Uh, Tennessee is <laughs> a Tennessee. Yeah, it's a great place, but it's, uh, it, it is most, a lot of people aren't just going to Chattanooga. So how did you yeah. kind of end up there and, and doing the, the women's studies? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, the academic job market in the humanities is, is sort of like wanting to become an actor and be paid for it. So you, you really can't, um, do it reasonably. Well, first of all, it's not a reasonable thing to do at all because they're mm -hmm. jobs and, and, uh, um, but if you do do it, you really have to be willing to move where any job is. Mm. Because the chance of even getting any job is, a, is, 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 is small. And why compared to acting is there are many, um, or mu music would be another example. There's just sure. a tremendously talented musicians, just phenomenally great that don't make any money at it. And then sometimes one might think there might be some that are making money that maybe aren't quite as good. So it's, yeah. It's not like just hard work or just being really smart means you'll get a job in philosophy. You could be perhaps one of the most brilliant people around and just luck and fortune wouldn't um, turn out for you. Mm -hmm. That's why I applied to a job at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, at the time, I was living in Germany, mm. and I just applied to every job that even remotely seemed like I could um, uh, take. And I came to Chattanooga and it, it, you know, it's in the South and I'm not from the South. Uh, and it, you know, first culturally was, was a bit of a challenge, but, um, sure. but it was a beautiful area and, and I like being outdoors and there's biking and hiking and, and, and the, it's a cute little cultural town too. There's some stuff to do. So, so yeah, it's just, the, just the job markets why I came to Chattanooga and I stayed because uh, it's a good job and I have a family here now. And um, yeah, that's great. That's great. And we, we can talk about it a little bit later, but um, now you mostly do uh, women's studies and sexuality and all that, or, or you're still doing the Merleau-Ponty kinds of stuff as well? Yeah, I, I've continued do, working with Merleau-Ponty. I'm using him to think um, a bit more now in my writings about the other side. Um, so not so much focused on the child's experience, but more about parenting mm. um, and some kind of issues in parenting. And I wrote a paper on... Um, emergent adults and helicopter parenting, which I sort of took a phenomenological perspective. Mm. So that's, um, so I'm still interested in using his work to think about uh, um, topics. I usually really like intersecting with research outside philosophy. So either mm. in the case of um, developmental research, or right now I'm very interested in um, the ethics of health norms. Mm. Uh, so I look at a lot in the kind of policies and procedures and studies about what makes us healthy. And then I like kind of using that to use phenomenology to kind of pull it apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, but yeah, I'm definitely thinking more in lines of my other, the book I have now is on um, uh, policies are, that surround um, the idea that we should be in charge of our health. Like the easy example that's super common in the U S now is, is, you know, the prohibition against smoking. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is something that, like, as individuals, we should, you know, we could think about diet and exercise as ways we take care of our health. And um, so I'm interested in why that's become such a dominant norm, what it does for how we relate to our bodies and relate to each other. Um, and that book has, has more 
um, interest in sort of some post-Marxist critiques and biopolitical critiques. So it's it's still got phenomenology in there, but it's looking at it from from some other an- angles. But I mm. yeah, I think uh, I think once you read somebody enough, they kind of get under your skin, and you sort of they're always kind of with you and you see the world that way. So I definitely say that's true. About uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Um, that's great. No, that's really great. It's, it's, it's really nice to hear somebody with a, a very strong and heavy background and emphasis on uh, philosophy looking at, uh, you know, public policy or health policy or things like that. I mean, I, I, I mean, I have my bias. I think, you know, I'm not a philosopher proper, but, I think we need more folks that are conceptualizing issues and problems with, you know, a very strong root um, being grounded or, or rooted in uh, philosophy. And so that makes total sense. If you understand Miller Ponti's uh, one of his main core aspects of embodiment or using the body through um, as a kind of vehicle of understanding experience. So I think. That's right. Great. Yeah. 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 So, so, so let's um. So I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of a how, how I've done things here on, on the on the podcast. So I've had a a variety of folks. Um, I've had some philosophers. I've had some obviously mm-hmm. professors of philosophy, and I've spent much of my time talking about um, talked about Aristotle. I've talked about Nietzsche. I've talked about Heidegger. I've talked about um, Hannah Arndt. Um, mm-hmm. Those are pretty. Those are the the common cast of characters that pop up on here. And yeah. so um, uh, uh, Heraclitus is also, uh, we, I had a, a podcast guest. We talked about Heraclitus for like an hour and a half. That was, that was fantastic that was as well. So, and I have one coming out um, uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks where Merleau Ponty is touched on, but uh, not, mm-hmm. not uh, kind of properly. So maybe give us uh, an overview of um, Merleau Ponty's kind of philosophy and okay. um, and kind of phenomenology, and and then we can get more specific. Great, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, Merleau Ponty is a mid uh, last century um, uh, Frenchman, and I think that people that if you if you've never heard of Merleau Ponty, you may have heard of uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre. So they were all friends and and sort of mm-hmm. in the same milieu. Uh, so that kind of dates Merleau Ponty. So World War II. And uh, I'd say his, you know, if there's, you know, the the main um, thing that he brings to philosophy is, and that I think he's universally celebrated for, is a, is thinking about what it means to have bodies and live in bodies. And so, um, and that sounds kind of uh, trite, I think, because <laughs> there are scientists, uh, well, since uh, uh, Aristotle and probably before this. Um, uh, uh, you know, who have thought seriously about the body and what is it like to have a body and how do bodies operate? And, you know, even Descartes, you know, dissected bodies, who's very interested in bodies. Mm-hmm. I think that the key insight is that it's not about, for Merleau-Ponty, he, is, he has interest in scientific, as it were, studies, but his, his focus is on how the fact that I have this body and I live in it affects how I see and process and think. So he's part of, you know, a group of thinkers that aren't all necessarily connected that want to think about um, knowledge is not uh, sort of first and foremost a set of thoughts or, or what we call in philosophy sometimes representation. So like you could imagine like your brain, and, and we do think this way, like you can almost think in a way that's like you could write it down, like it's coming out in words or it's not coming out, but it is words mm-hmm. in my brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that tendency in philosophy and, and in other kinds of thinking about thinking, I guess, you know, not just in philosophy, has tended to assume that the way I interact with the world is, is through these thoughts, these kind of verbalizable thoughts. Um, uh, and then I kind of go around and like have experiences and then use my thinking stuff to dissect them. And Marilyn Ponty argues that, you know, first and foremost, we have kinds of senses of bodily meaning and understanding. And later we develop these complex abstract systems of language to discuss them. So, um, and the easiest example, you know, would be thinking about the way a baby or a child perceives the world. It, it, 
they obviously are interacting with the world and, and they, you know, if you've ever seen like a little kid crawl on the ground and stick pebbles in its mouth and you're horrified because they shouldn't stick pebbles in their mouth, but they're obviously like exploring right. and sort of trying to figure out tactically what's going on. Mm-hmm. They look at people, they're interested in, in objects. Um, but it seems weird to say they're thinking in a kind of, they're like having a language in their head. They're like, what is this thing? You know, then it seems something else is, is happening there. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way, which you could think about what, the way you interact with the people like live with you or, you know, that you're, you're close to, you, you just kind of know their presence and know the way there's this, their feet sound on the stairs and you, you can kind of see them. And if they're, you can like immediately know they're in a bad mood by their affect, you know, because you know this person well, and probably it's not that you have to think it all out. It just is sort of a, a kind of knowledge about like who they are and what their body means and what the, what your connection to that body is. Um, so it's not, it's not, it sounds sometimes I think if you hear it little like new agey, um, and I, you know, certainly Milo Ponti did not see it that way. You can take it that way. I mean, people could, could extend it that Mm way. Um, but you know, he really thought of this as a, uh, as the kind of fundamental way in which we interact with the world. Um, it's this, this embodied experience upon which later different different kinds of knowledge are, are built. Mm. So um, there, his work is used in, in many different areas. I mean, within just people who just want to think about what he says, but um, it's used in um, uh, ethics of particularly ethics of care, some kind of so healthcare, nursing ethics, medical ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, ethics of of different kinds of counseling practice, um, and it's also used in thinking about things like habit and breaking habits and understanding habits. Um, a lot of people like to use the example for his bodily knowledge of that if you play the guitar or the piano or something, once you master it, you don't sit at the piano and think, okay, C D F, <laughs> like you just. You, you know, especially if you've memorized a song, you just play it. It just kind of comes out of your fingers. When you're first learning, you're thinking that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it becomes, and then yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, it's right, super yeah. awkward and stilted because you're like. You're, you're, you're very focused on it. But then it becomes yeah. a muscle memory. And it just. Exactly. You could play something and you you could almost do it and not even think about it. Right. You just, it's kind of happening. Right. Yeah. And that's the kind of. And then if you play with other people, there's also that kind of. The, the way that once you play enough together, you're sort of all interacting in this in this really embodied mm-hmm. way. That it's not separate from the way you'd you'd think about like what do I think about this political news item, but it it's different in an important way. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, so his stuff's really fun to think about those kinds of connections and you know why some things work for some people and not others and mm-hmm. and. And stuff in um you might be aware of this in uh neurology about kind of mirror neurons that you mm-hmm. know really mm-hmm. map mm-hmm. our our understanding of our learning on watching other people's bodies um and that uh it's not a kind of again processing in some sort of cognitive abstract way what's happening with them we actually learn by by watching and by imitating yeah i would say one of the things that is um interesting i've talked about it before is so uh, for listeners you know edmund husserl is kind of the the big guy first he's the grandfather Mm -hmm. of phenomenology and so when i i'm actually teaching now when i teach existential theory and, and therapy you know we spend a lot of time with philosophers and trying to explain phenomenology is is can be difficult for some people to understand yeah. but um you know phenomenology is this notion of you know to the things themselves right how are you just trying to describe experience which is mm-hmm. a hard thing because for so long kind of what you're saying in the in the western canon it was this objective subjective kinds of notions and you could describe the world and you could describe people objectively right uh, or you could drive their subjective experiences and Sometimes people misunderstand that phenomenologist, of which Muriel Ponty fits mm-hmm. into that ca- camp, is not that you don't do those things or that we shouldn't do those things, 
but that that's not all that there is, that there is something that has to be this uncovering or unveiling, which is experience itself that is kind of through and between and on top and around the objective subjective dichotomy. And so in this way, you know, so Edmund Husserl with his, you know, signs of essence, mm-hmm. and then obviously Heidegger with his Dasein notion of being and then being in the world. And so you find Merleau Ponty that comes on the scene. And the thing, kind of what you were just saying, was he, there's two things that I really loved about Merleau Ponty, which is how do we understand experience, but not as something that lives in a vacuum or something that is sort of in the ether, but that's something that's embodied. And so, you know, in one sense, you could say for humans, if you don't have a body and if you don't have, um, you know, experience has nothing to travel in of sorts. Mm-hmm. And so as, as experience comes out of a body or, or, or rather through mm-hmm. a bo- the body, that is um, shifting and moving how we perceive things. And so if people read his, his writings, namely his magnum opus, you know, Phenomenology mm-hmm. of Perception, it's all about, he does take a very, some, in some places, technical aspect of physiology he talks about depth perception and you know the eye mm-hmm. and he's it's very yeah. technical but he's trying to understand what are the kind of uh, functions of experience through the body and then w- how you explain i think was great because mm-hmm. it shows how do we then understand beyond an objective subjective way of un- of 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 knowledge when you're trying to apply it in different disciplines or fields how do we say okay we can explain what's going on if you take like health, for mm-hmm. example. You can explain that this is the, the challenge or this is what how this is functioning, but how does it have a sense of presence or yeah. what does it mean to be in this space with someone else? And what that um that has a whole that's that is the phenomenology, that is the experience. And then how through the body that's happening is going to impact our perceptions of the world around us and the other, and then with even ourselves. Um, yeah great i love how you said that idea of like between and below and in between things because i think early kind of critiques of phenomenology were like oh so you just do introspection we just sort of like sit around and think like how do i feel today or what do i think about x and and i think that um you know phenomenology is is in a certain way sometimes better thought of as as describing what is so present and so part of our experience we can't think about it Mm -hmm. Um, like you think of something like depth perception or you know that's why all this labor over these kinds of issues in perception where we just sort of think we're just seeing what is which of course we both are and are not you know and so trying to get at the the things that are so present and so close to us um that we can't um think about them without a very detailed sort of thoughtful way in which we, you know, there's this thing called the, which you well know, like the reduction and there's this, there's sort of this specific method and Marilyn Ponty is not a strict follower of that yes. of method, you know, right. but, right. but um, yeah. So, it, um, you know, and, and, and although he doesn't do this, a lot of, uh, or it doesn't do it very much. A lot of contemporary phenomenologists that that use his work think about, say, something like racism as this kind of surface experience. Of course, there might be people who have like these explicitly racist beliefs that are wandering around, like trying to um, uh, using them to live in the world. Mm-hmm. But but you know that it doesn't really explain. You know, if you want to think about something like privilege or the way that you know certain bodies can walk into certain spaces and it's just like really easy and fine for them, mm-hmm. don't think about it. And other bodies to walk into spaces is not that way. Mm-hmm. There's nothing objectively necessarily different about the space, um, um, but it's rather about the way in which certain certain places have been structured and certain norms and body habits over time have been structured. Mm-hmm. And so you just sort of keep talking about like the idea of the beliefs. It doesn't really get at, you know, kind of something structural like racism mm-hmm. um, uh, in a society. It just gets at sort of the individuals with those particular beliefs, but that's, you know, maybe that's part of it, but what I would sort of suggest that maybe not the primary part of it in many societies. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a interesting way of 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 mapping on his again and, and a really you know that's this one thing that is is really nice about what you're saying is you're you're taking the dense philosophy and mapping on to okay well how do we see this in our world around us right how do we understand it in different domains and I, I certainly agree that we have in in certain contexts or in certain um, uh, settings you know when we're when we're coming into a room or we're coming into a place, there's a way of being, right? There's something, there's what it's like to experience this moment or what mm -hmm. it's like to experience in the space. And, and I think that that is particularly instructive of how that could look differently for some people, which all of them have, you know, I kind of see this, um, this is a uh, uh, Husserl um, horizontalization where it's just everything's mm -hmm. kind of flat, right? It's like, okay, we're not going to, we're going to say like everything has everything kind of is on an equal playing field and how do we understand just the descriptive aspects of what this experience is like we're not putting necessarily value judgments on it we're right. trying to understand you know what it is and then what what that experience is like and then you can determine you know all of the realm of possibilities of how you want to you know kind of uh, you know, maneuver forth so yeah 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 and you could you think you know can think too about you know, the, the contingent parts of experience that, and the sort of what seem like the necessary parts of experience, you mm. know, um, I really even enjoyed, you know, Marilyn Ponte's work on illness. And, and then he's sort of, I should say somewhat brief comments, but then the work that's come out of that. Um, and illness is such a, 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 a fascinating discussion because there is a part that, that, especially if you're thinking of illness caused by what we can discern as a disease, mm -hmm. Um, there's this part that just seems really objective and, you know, measurable. And, but I mean, the experience of illness is so diverse and so, yep. um, you know, uh, or pain is another chronic pain discussion. So using Meryl Ponte's work to think about chronic pain is really interesting too, because he, you, you, you can't think about it without thinking about the experience of the person. I mean, something like pain is, you know, if it's, if it's felt. Mm -hmm. And so there's some, I think his, you know, he has this idea that what's called the intentional arc, you know, so the way I kind of go out into the world and I'm, just, you know, just sort of do my habitual things and I'm focused on my projects, like going to work and, um, and that in illness, it becomes broken or he says goes limp. That's another way he talks about it. And it, so that, you know, when you're sick, even, in, even when you're just sick with something like maybe not too life threatening, you know, it's like everything's a hassle and your body hurts and you can't just, yeah. Go do the stuff in the world. And then if um, you know, if you're living with people who are sick, this causes you to become your whole world becomes um, you know, uh changed, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 so I think those are sort of um kind of everyday examples. If anyone's known anyone who suffered from a long-term illness, that, that, that it's it, it affects of course that individual, but it affects everybody who cares about that individual mm -hmm. in sort of really significant ways. And that just talking about the biology of the disease doesn't fails to capture any of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think of uh Sartre where he talks about the other and he talks about where you know, he had these, he, he always makes this leap, which some people disagree with, where man's responsible for himself and then is responsible for all humans, right? Is that kind mm -hmm. of notion. And so is that, is it kind of getting at the same point that it's like, yeah, I could have, you know, uh, some type of illness or I could be ill, but that's going to impact. There's always impact in how, how it works with other people, because obviously for us as humans, we're never within lived lived space. We're never in isolation, right? We're always um, our being is always colliding with other, uh, at the very least, entities or whether it's nature or whether it's mm -hmm. objects, but or with other people. And so there's this, I think, responsibility of how are we mindful of how our existence and how our being is interacting with other people in the world as well. And then, and then the, the, the potential shifts that could happen because of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask about, so we kind of leading up to it is so <laughs> there's, so yes, yeah, so, so I, you know, I do clinical psychology mm -hmm. and 
kind of what you were saying about with illness. So this is something, again, I tell students and sometimes I tell clients as well. I could have 10 people in this room right now that all carry a diagnosis of uh, bipolar one disorder, let's say. Mm -hmm. And their symptoms could be this, you know, you have to have enough of the mm -hmm. a particular set of constellation of symptoms to have the disorder, the label. Mm -hmm. But each person is going to have a different experience and how those of those symptoms and they're, and they're going to ex have that different experience of what it means to be them, what it is like mm -hmm. to, for them to experience themselves and then how they maneuver in the world. And, you know, obviously you can mix, um, you know, biology and genetics mm -hmm. and all that is influencing, but also the environment and, and cultural norms. Mm -hmm. And so I think of it in the same way of, you know, psychology is, um, you know, what did, what did Husserl say? Psychology is a science of, of facts or reality, which is mm -hmm. true. It's you're trying to explain behavior, you're trying to explain how things are, are operating, but it's still missing out on what the experience of those behaviors are, the symptoms are. And that's, particularly instructive, I think. So mm -hmm. I say that because how do you understand, I feel, so I didn't know this actually mm -hmm. until I, I read the, the, the lecture you translated. Mm -hmm. I, I totally just didn't realize that he was a, 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 on the psychology department in the yeah. university. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, and so, and you know, he's, he's got plenty of, uh, fun criticisms about, uh, Piaget and I think behaviors mm -hmm. it and, uh, which is always fun to read. Um, but how do you see Marilu Ponti and how he interacts with philosophy and, and you know, subset phenomenology, and then also how he interacts with psychology? Because he doesn't see psychology as the enemy. He actually talks favorably about psychology, um, almost as this kind of alignment, right? Or this kind of side by side. But how do you see kind of his work of, you know, he's kind of got you know, a foot in each world, right? He's definitely mm -hmm. in the philosophy world. He does have a, a very unique contribution in the psychology world. And so maybe talk a little bit about how you see that. Yeah, so the, um, uh, you know, his original work, his original sort of publications were in, in sort of thinking about um, psychology and then his first book, The Structure of Behavior, um, you know, really takes up animal studies and all sort of whole variety mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, what what we would think about is is probably not being in a in a philosophy a traditional philosophy department. So I think that his he he doesn't in those lectures and in his other writings I would say develop um, like a full psychology of of the human, um, and he also doesn't uh, provide a kind of like here's how you're going to treat people like, you know, that you could teach just, you know, just him. But he has a lot of really fascinating um, interpretations of like psychodrama. His interpretation of psychoanalysis is, I think, really interesting, really adds to some of what Sartre did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, to me, some of the, the kind of takeaways that I, I still feel are, are profound. I, I'm always hesitant to say if they're, they're right, but um, is one is that he sees that, you know, the child is, is that we have a, a predisposition to create, to make, to, to have a coherent experience of whatever our experience is. Mm -hmm. And, and that this is, this is prior, it becomes connected with learning a language and interacting in a sort of complex social world, but that even the, the infant and the child are trying to structure the world in meaningful holes. Mm -hmm. And so for him, what he interprets uh, goes on in, in, in sort of a, a conflict or when somebody has that capacity to do so is, is damaged in some way or hindered is that he thinks that the, the way he understands like a, um, a complex, a, a psychoanalytic complex, is that it's like you originally form this structure to try and hold on, and then it it's rigid and it can't respond in a helpful way to changing circumstances. Hmm. Um, so again, I, I wouldn't even begin to think that this summarizes um, uh, all uh, complexes or all sort of issues that people have, but. 
Um, uh, so it seems to him part of that way of creating a meaningful world that you're interacting and can move into in a in a in a um, a Heimlich manner, you know, in the German, like a kind of comfortable manner, mm-hmm. um, is that you have some flexibility um, in integrating new experiences. Mm. So, and sometimes that would be would be hindered not by you or not by anything that's about your fundamental sort of composition, but about it's hindered by your society or it's hindered by um, these kinds of, of issues. So I really like that kind of, it's an interesting idea. It sort of builds on Gestalt psychology, built on this idea that, you know, um, uh, von Uxkuhl and others who sort of want to see um, uh, uh, this, this tendency towards coherence, but not again, not an intellectual coherence. It's, it's a very lived coherence. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I think, I think it's mentioned in the lectures and I think maybe elsewhere this, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sassur, uh, mm-hmm. with his structuralism. Yeah. Um, and I think he's kind of, you know, he talked about that in terms of the structure of language, which is, you know, in, I would say probably opposition to what Derrida did, you know, mm-hmm. where he was, you know, deconstructing all that. But, um, Ruh Ponty does seem this does seem to have, cause he really likes Gestalt psychology. Uh, he has some criticisms of it, but he tries mm-hmm. to say like, how do we understand sort of the parts, but then within context of the whole. And so in, in some ways, the, the child is the, is the same. There was something, I think it was in the, let me see here. I think it was in, yes, it was in the lecture or lectures, or I should say, on human sciences and phenomenology, which was a mm-hmm. fantastic uh, a chapter in the book, where he is talking a lot about Husserl and Gestalt psychology. And he has this, this interesting notion that I, I i never really thought about and i don't know how much i again I'm, I'm i'm kind of with you it's profound i don't know if maybe the validity of it is you know you can mm-hmm. debate but this notion that <clears throat> uh, adults adult humans they a lot of them if he, when his his critique of piaget is that they're doing this kind of imposition of sorts of the fully developed adult brain and adult uh life is in, superimposed onto the child as if they're trying to just push up into what it means to be uh, living in the world as an adult. Yeah. And he kind of legitimately, this is kind of the image I got was, you know, Marilla Ponti is getting on all fours on the floor and is just mm-hmm. right there at eye level with the infant, the toddler, the child mm-hmm. to try and say that their world legitimately or their world and or their experience legitimately looks and feels and is different. It is a different experience. Yeah. It is not an adult world. And kind of what you're saying, this maps onto they're creating a structure that has, um, you know, it's just a certain core to it. But you know, as it obviously as people develop and evolve, it's gonna it's gonna grow. And I don't know, you know, my my I, I like that way of thinking about it. I think it's very helpful. I think to think about it that way, in terms of the truthfulness or not, I think my my critique of that probably would be something like, yes, I think that's partially right. I think the thing that is that threads through it is that the fact that we're all humans. And so nothing happens. In, you know, when you think about a developmental model, all of the things you have at, you know, three, four, five, and then all the way throughout the developmental stages, those stay with you. Those and those are all, you know, part of how you're doing things. And so mm-hmm. there is this kind of I don't know if there's a pool, but there is this, as you develop as an adult, you you are going to have a different experience of the world as an adult, but that's predicated based on all of the things you've had as a child and as an adolescent. And so there's a, it's interesting. I think he's like half right. It's like, I like the way he looks at it because it's, yes, you can't superimpose all these adult notions of, Mm -hmm. of the world and how that's experienced onto a child that literally has no conception of that and doesn't have the mental or brain capacity to have that. And so it would be best to conceptualize what is the structure and then experience of the child, um, mm-hmm. which I thought was, was, was very fascinating that, and especially in that chapter, I think a little bit other chapters as well. Yeah. 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 I think he, he, he thinks that, that there's, you know, and this follows, he, again, even though he was good friends with Lacan and, and he actually is one of the first people to talk about the mirror stage, um, you know, he, he, 
I think this is the influence, the, his Freudianism. It's it's not accurate mm-hmm. Freud in, by any means, but yeah, yeah. there's something lost. <clears throat> yes. That in development and in, in, and in the acquisition of language, that there are certain and it, and they are. I would agree with you that I don't think he thinks they're sort of lost in some sort of radical way, but that you know, as as in the psychoanalytic tradition, you you can't access them through your adult brain in any kind of straightforward way. You can't just like remember because yeah. you're remembering a stage in which you didn't form memories connected to language. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're you know they so they have this this um, this kind of ghost like experience, I guess, or part you know kind of shadow, shape our experience. Yeah. Yeah. These, these ways that are you know, super significant, but then also really hard to, mm-hmm. to kind of point to in a clear way. So, um, so I think he, he's somebody who definitely thinks there, there are patterns of development. Um, and he is very, uh, I should say he's a man of his times in the sense that, um, he does take up fairly significantly women's experience, but there is a, fairly sort of um, unicultural normativity to the way he thinks about many of these things, which is, a, you know, sometimes is a bit disappointing because he, he wasn't living in a bubble or something like that. Sure. But, yeah. um, but he did think that there are these, the, a lot was contingent uh, that he thought, you know, development has the physical body developing, has a certain trajectory, a kind of natural path, but that, it it needs to meet up in culture in a certain way, you know, that it, it it's not sort of inevitably, like if you just develop neurotypically, you just inevitably are going to have these right. achievements. But he definitely thought there was a physical push, you know, of going through something like puberty. It's not just cultural, certainly. I mean, there's a, yeah. a lot happening to you that's going to have to manifest in some manner. And then the question is, how do you interpret that? Is that has a lot to do with your culture. So it looks very different for girls and for boys. Mm-hmm. Um, and he mm-hmm. cites this uh, French psychoanalyst, uh, uh, Hélène Deutsch significantly in thinking about that. And, and Simone de Beauvoir too. Yeah, yeah. So before we get to uh, kind of your, your, I guess your more current yeah. work, I did, the last thing I want to say about, about this point is, um, you know, I, I, I've kind of said very strongly, um, every psychologist, every psychology student, at, a, at least at a master's or, 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 or doctorate level, you know, should be reading Merleau-Ponty. I, I just, I firmly believe that. I mean, he, his contribution to the field of psychology is grossly understated. Um, mm-hmm. And he has, I mean, even if you just look at his stuff on perception alone, it's like, you, you should at least have that as, um, you know, that should, his, his idea should at least be on the menu, um, mm-hmm. where you're, uh, you know, engaging with that because that really pushes, um, and challenges, I think, uh, uh, folks that are studying psychology to really understand, okay, we can do all the science and the re- literature and the research, and that's very important, but we also have to have, and I'm a big person on, you have to have a, a, a philosophy, a conceptualization of how we get to these things and how we understand these things. There's a grid that it's coming through. And right, right. Is, 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 you know, he's a badass for that. <laughs> yeah. I wondered too, if it might help in, in, um, well, in the, certainly in the American um, tradition in psychology is, is also maybe sort of more philosophy of science. Yeah. yeah. So that I think that's such a, um, a powerful way in which to disrupt the, you know, it, there's, Merleau Ponty loved experiments. I mean, he loved, you know, mm-hmm. he likes them, he's interested in them. I think if he was around today, he would, you know, be, take a, a sincere interest in them. So I don't, it's not, it's not some sort of like relativist critique of science, but just that the, the scientist too is interpreting the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the the yeah. example I always give to students is, okay, you know, very heavy scientific method, scientific mm-hmm. method, which is absolutely you know a wonderful wonderful way in which we understand the world around us but you know the first thing i say is well how do how do we start a scientific experiment so well you have to develop a hypothesis mm-hmm. so, yes where does that come from well it comes from observation about certain you know potential behaviors and how there might be an interaction or correlation it's like yeah but the question that you're asking is coming from somewhere that's mm-hmm. coming from the experience that's coming from your perception 
of how you're trying to analyze, you know, two, three, four, whatever variables about some question that mm-hmm. is, you know, this kind of pre-reflective way of trying to understand there's something here. There's this kind of instinctual, like there's something here and I want to mm-hmm. explore and see what that is. You, you need the person to have that question or series of questions. And that's coming from somewhere. And that's definitely coming from a, I would say a, a phenomenological kind of notion. So mm-hmm. it's, it's important for people to have some, like you're saying, a philosophy of science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell me you have, um, so when you're, when you're not doing, when you're not translating and you're not writing about Merleau Ponty <laughs> and reading Merleau Ponty, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, um, you're doing, um, is it, uh, uh, female studies, gender studies? How, what's gender, the kind yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, so I teach in that field, and I'm very uh, influenced by, you know, I'd say actually the kind of my um, main sort of initial interest was both canonical figures like Simone de Beauvoir um, and uh, the psychoanalytic tradition like Lucy Rigori and others in that mm-hmm. field, but, but also um, by um, feminists that use Merleau-Ponty's work um, to think about issues of, of gender and sexuality and identity. So that's kind of, those are the people I think about a lot. And, and for me, why I, I've always really liked tying philosophy um, to uh, both experimental research or on, you know, studies or, or, you know, events that are happening or, you know, so I, I like using philosophy to think about other things that aren't philosophy. So I'm not a, I'm not doing like the, fundamental nature of ontology or you know i'm sort of like i don't know like what should i stop smoking like i'll ask these very mundane sort of questions but uh, um and and so you know there in fantasy you know there's these issues of like well what what is it like do i am i a woman or how do i know i'm a woman or why why is there sexism or you know how do So there's sort of issues that, um, uh, you know, I've thought a lot about norms of of dress and behavior, which are interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. uh, There's nothing. uh, um, uh, uh, So students are really love that stuff. Love talking about that stuff. You know, like sort of norms of of what our hair should look like and how much hair should we have and where should we have hair and um, these very kind of everyday things you could read about in a magazine, but that I find, um, interesting because they're connected to the way we relate to our bodies and see our bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so that, that work has been, uh, uh, certainly influential to me. Uh, and then I'm also quite interested in, um, through that, I got interested in the, um, uh, the kind of demonization in the American experience in particular, I don't think it's unique to America, but uh, of, of weight and of fatness Hmm. and and this, this idea, because it's it's very closely tied to kind of notions of modifying your body for appearance. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of what became interesting to me and what, what got me into the, some of my current research is it both is about, Appearance, but then it's also usually sold as health. Like the reason we're concerned about weight is for your health. Um, and you can see this interesting shift in diet advertisements away from like fit into your beach bikini into um, don't you want to run around with the grandkids? You know, mm-hmm. so there's this, this uh, interesting to my mind sort of um, normative dimension to thinking about health behavior, modifying your behavior, modifying how you treat your body for health reasons that I think is often unexamined. Whereas I think it's very, I think, you know, if you're remotely sort of culturally sensitive, people have examined, you know, the objectification of women's bodies and there's there's ways you can, it's not easy, but you can critique it. And I think you could probably talk to a group of 14 year olds and they could think about it, you know, and say, yeah, it's not fair. People are judged for their looks or, you know, they so that's not a, um, it's still ongoing and it's still a big problem. And I'm not saying it's sort of solved, but like thinking about it, it's not difficult. But objectifying somebody for their perceived health behaviors, I think is very common and is not considered critically. And I, I, I don't, I'm sort of interested in that project, like thinking about um, 
uh, how that's kind of connected with aesthetics, with sort of how we want to see bodies, with objectification, but then also with all of the burgeoning research in health sciences about this is bad for you, <laughs> this is good for you, which, which, you know, when Marilyn Ponti was writing this, we didn't have this sort of flood of information about yeah. diet and exercise and air quality and all of these. So there's, so I think that's kind of an interesting part too, that obviously influences how we see ourselves and how we relate to our bodies. Yeah. I'd be curious to see what he thinks about all of the kind of, I guess, censure we've done on, on smoking cigarettes. You know, he was, you know, <laughs> he was a good Frenchman and I know he loved his cigarettes. So um, yeah, be interesting, you know, kind of, kind of with the yeah. knowledge we have now and understanding of it, you know, it'd be very <laughs> interesting to see that. But yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um, uh, I, I mean, I, again, I, this is these kinds of mundane interests that, that interest me. I sort of have been interested for quite a while in how, normal it has become for like people who have regular careers and everything to like have exercise programs is like a big part of their hobbies, which I think in Merle Pantis time would have been very rare for the average person to mm -hmm. train, to have training as part of their, and I'm not against people doing that. I'm just sort of thinking it's interesting culturally that move yes. um, in particularly in the middle classes and the upper classes towards seeing your body as a as an object of, of intense sort of scrutiny and focus for pleasurable focus too. Not, you know, I don't, um, I think it's, it's a negative. It's just sort of an interesting cultural shift. And I think even in the seventies, it would have been quite, yeah. um, it would have been a very small subset of people who would have mm -hmm. done that. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the one thing I want to ask you about is about, um, this is a very big question and we could have a longer conversation about it, you know, maybe at some other point, but just very cursory kind of glance there within philosophy. And then how we are talking about it now, there's, um, again, you would know more than I would at least four waves of, of feminism now, right? You have kind of the old school Wollstonecraft, I think is first mm -hmm. wave, if I remember. And then you have De Beauvoir and, and Betty Friedan and, you know, second wave. And then I guess you have Judith Butler is probably third wave. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's, what, there's a kind of current wave that maybe is fourth or whatever, but just in general, the, how do you see the arc of it? And then how do you, how do we, how do we navigate through all this in a, in a, in a respectful and, but healthy, helpful way, I think. Yes, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, I do think you can definitely sort of see the kind of early just concerns with just women being able to go to school and be able to vote and have just sort of basic, um, at least legal equality um, as the first wave. Um, uh, I find the the, sec the rest of the waves a little less, um, as waves, less helpful because I still think many of the issues that Simone de Beauvoir raised are, are super pertinent, important issues. Um, uh, um, there, are, I mean, there are people that, you know, or sometimes I guess the fourth wave sometimes is thought about as post-feminist. So people who think of the feminist project as, as being done. So I guess I would say by not answering your question and what's the thing in <laughs> answer the question yeah like in a, in a job interview that you know i don't i don't know the answer to your question so uh -huh. the, the question I'll, I'll, I'll the thing i'll say is um i think one of the big in feminist theory to me one of the big um divides in academic feminists has been um in the u.s over the kind of this this what were called the porn wars where the activist community, which was always very kind of tightly connected with the academic community, broke off. Um, and so there's this kind of this, this idea that sort of people like Butler and so and others, who she was not personally involved in this, this debate about porn, but um, were sort of more just doing these kind of rarefied academic studies are very, very hard to approach and from the average person to read. And they were disconnected from the political advocacy for, say, abortion rights or um, hmm. equality before the law. And so I think one of the questions I think about a lot is what is the connection between thinking about gender and thinking about um, sexuality and actual issues that those things might pertain to? You know, is, is the personal always the political? Should we... Um, or, or can, is there just sort of a place for just studying these things with no 
I mean, it could become political, but it could just be its own study sure. and it, right. it got, yeah. or could could become therapeutic maybe in, in the case, but not necessarily have a connection to, um, and I mean, politics, broadly speaking, I don't just mean law. Mm -hmm. you know. And I, f I find that an interesting question. I think one that doesn't, to me, have a simple answer. Um, but there are many people who I would say feel very strongly and are very convinced that, that, that you know, um, that there must be to, to uh, if you're looking at and you're thinking as a feminist, that there has to be this connection to sort of a political social engagement. Hmm. So you're you're kind of isolating things in a in a or not you but you're the way you're describing it is this kind of isolation of there's the kind of <clears throat> the academic nature of things uh, mm -hmm. how we understand you know um, uh, feminism or feminist theory or you know, gender sexuality and then there's kind of the more where political activists or just activists in general kind of take it and they're not always. Uh, aligned um you know completely right they they, they only ha they have their own kind of compass that they're using right and i i think that when you talked about phenomenologies like like in husserlian phenomenology when you used to do this i think you called it like horizontal horizontal like where we'll we'll not we'll just try to describe things we're not going to be invested in if they're good or bad or right or wrong yes. or true or true or false you know even yeah even if our experience is accurate about um you know, to me, uh, that's kind of always this tension in 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 phenomenology. You know, okay, so we've done that, and do we? Does it compel us when we go out and leave our offices and are just mm -hmm. you know pondering these things and trying to work on them and work through them, which is valuable work, I think, mm -hmm. um, to live a certain way. You know. And it's, it's, it's an issue, I think, in philosophy for a long time, where is philosophy about how, to, how do I live, like, not just as a professor, but how do I live as a human being, as a citizen, as a mother, you know, I mean, um, and so traditionally, I think feminism has had a strong connection, like, it is about how you live. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about thinking about things, but it's also about how you live. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always think, like, in phenomenology, there's sometimes a bit of a tension there, because that's sort of giving up the demand to to like do you then lose part of experience when you push towards sort of living in a certain way mm -hmm. and that makes sense you know yeah yeah um, because you're trying to there, find a mold that you're trying to there's a certain type of mold or a script that comes with that depending on whose perception or who you're asking and so if you're mm -hmm. trying to fit into this kind of uh, i guess some ident identity then are you stunting the uh, ability to unlock the experience from your own being? If you're trying to make it mold into a particular model of sorts of, you know, what it is to be a mom or what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a, you know, whatever, like that's, right. you know, is it those, those constructs aren't necessarily bad. I mean, then they exist, but it's more of, but how do we find the individual component of your, you know, phenomenological experience? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and what do you do with that? <laughs> like, what do you do with it? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a, a kind of phenomenology that I, it, called critical phenomenology, and uh, um, I think fairly new. And uh, I mean, there. I think I think you know, uh, Marilyn Ponty and his political writings, and Simone de Beauvoir, and, and her work, and Sartre. We're all critical phenomenologists. So, mm -hmm. and, but what? But the kind of articulation of this uh, in the last, um, I guess, you know, decade has been this idea that, um, you know, doing phenomenology with an eye on uh, using some of the, the resources in critical theory, which is, um, which is inherently connected to this idea of social and political change and the need to address things like suffering and so forth. Um, and uh, so I really enjoy that. I, I, not by any means an expert, but I think it's an interesting sort of uh, movement in phenomenology. And I think there's going to be people who are going to work on fundamental problems of, um, you know, do transcendental phenomenology and they, the critical project will not be their project. I think that's good. I don't think everyone needs to do anything, but, but I like that I'm trying to tie up um, phenomenology with advocating for prison reform or like, you know, stuff that is, 
you you get people to to be invested in things by fully describing things to them and exposing them to like the example I gave earlier about racism. Like if you yeah. think about um, something like white privilege, you know, to me, I was when I first started, which actually shows my privilege and actually thought about it at all, you know, for most of my life. When I started thinking about that, well, how phenomenological this is, you know, thinking about how I live and, and, and move in the world and how I'm not conscious of, of that, um, that part that, you know, for me, especially like living somewhere like Tennessee, just um, you very easily fit in um, uh, just because of the way am I, you know, I'm perceived. Yeah, and I, and I think that the, the I, I I definitely hear you, and and I think in terms of the critical phenomenology piece of it, it's interesting. It's you know, it's it's an interesting way of where that could go. I mean, in terms of will we experience, we explain all these things, and we do all these things, and so what do I do with it? You know, this is why, as much as I love phenomenology and I love all of these guys uh, and, and girls, I I you know Nietzsche is still the pinnacle for me. Uh, cause he was, you know, he had the true philosophy of life and he wanted to do life and, and yeah. uh, that's, he's still always top for me, but, uh, Nietzsche, yeah, yeah. I tell you that he's someone who, uh, um, uh, talk about getting under my skin. I often will say, I oh, yeah. feel like the, the longest and most fractious relationship I've had in my life is the one with Nietzsche. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, he's well, all he, the time. I sort of have these arguments with him in my head. And I, I yeah, um, the yeah. same thing. I, I have the arguments. I'll hear whatever voice I've created. I hear the words on the page and I'm just like, man, like, you know, it's just, he, he is someone that has, you know, no bottom to the, you know, profound elements of his, of his, uh, um, thought. And yeah. it's, it's, it's great. It's great. But, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, I never wanted to, I uh, I wrote a little bit about him, but I never wanted to work on him because I, I don't know if that, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I heard that like when Mark Twain was this, was the, what do you call that, the steamboat driver, and he learned all the depths of the bottom of the Mississippi since it's such a shallow river, the the love of the Mississippi was gone for him. Yeah, yeah. And it's I like, always felt like there's certain people you love reading and like, you don't, when you research them, uh, Sometimes uh, it sort of takes away a little bit from just the pleasure of reading them. Yeah, it, it, it was that you know, don't meet your heroes or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, don't meet your right, idols or whatever. Right, you know, it's, right, it's, it's, right. it's one of those things. You know, people have said, "Would you ever want to meet Nietzsche?" I'm like, "Yes," and then I'd be like, "Ah, oh, no." I think it kind of ruined it for mm-hmm. me. So there's a there's an interesting thing with that. So there is a book by Frank Truaki. I think I'm saying his last name correctly. Called is on Merleau-Ponty and Nietzsche, and I bought. Oh, wow. Esther, but just working during COVID, I haven't gotten around to it. Um, but uh, but it it it's interesting because I don't know of many um, attempts to connect those two, other than maybe just as a small asides. You know, not, uh, but, yeah. You know. I would I would love to read that. That sounds that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay, you have been very generous with your time. I want to respect yeah. it and. Um, yeah, this was a, a wonderful conversation. I I have been, you know, needing that itch scratch to talk about Merleau Ponty uh, with with uh, someone that you know has t- translated and written about him and studied him. So I really appreciate you um, taking the time to talk about him and his ideas and uh, explain a whole lot. And so uh, maybe tell listeners if you if you want where they can they can find you if you, publicly or or point you to okay, your work. Okay, yeah. Done. Um, I guess, well, I mean, you know, I'm at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, but uh, I'd say I, ha- I post a lot of my uh, writing on academia.edu. So you just search Tolly Welsh academia.edu. And there I have a lot of articles and um, parts of my books and stuff. So if you wanted to um, look there, I think that'd probably be the best place to sort of see, see some of the stuff I'm doing and see if it's interesting. Okay. Okay. No, that's great. Um, well, I, I, again, I feel super lucky yeah, to have talked you so to you and, and I appreciate yeah. it. And so thank you for your time. Yeah. What, what, a, what a fun, uh, it was a, a pleasure for me too. Yes. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. All right. okay, take care. Okay. Bye.